Uh, without any further ado, because we've cut a little bit into time, Miklos coming all the way up from London, yeah. in England. Yeah. yeah, still down there. And we're delighted to have you. Fire away. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great honor for me to, uh, to lecture here. And uh, I'm especially uh, grateful to Professor Newman for being accepted with, with my very late registration. Uh, as far as my research is are concerned, uh, I'm working currently for the Institute of Ismaili Studies in London. And uh, the main subject of my research is, uh, focuses on the locality or the Caspianness of the Nizari state, as more especially the contacts, the diplomatic relations, and the policy they pursued uh, in the Caspian provinces, uh, more specifically in Dailam, in Gilan, in Mazenderan. Uh, and in other neighboring areas from the period of Hassan al Sabah until the final fall of the Nizari state during the Ilkhanid period. Uh, as for the uh, subalternity or the, the subaltern position of this area, it is well known that the Caspian provinces uh, were one of the main, uh, most favorite areas for asylum seekers, persecuted religious minorities from the late antiquity uh, often took shelter here, uh, such as the Mesdekites in the late Sassanian period or later in the, uh, in the Islamic conquest, groups of Sassanian aristocracy also appeared here and, and funded post-Sassanian uh, 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 principalities. Later, groups of Zaydites, different communities of the Ismailis, such as Karmatis, Fatim Ismailis, and of course the Nizar Ismailis appeared, and, of, and, of, and Tverveshis. Uh, uh, there are uh, reports about uh, Nestorian Christian groups as well. Uh, so the being subaltern in this area is somehow it's a, both in, it's a question of periphery and center, and of course a, a, a religious or ethnic uh, clashes. Uh, so sometimes it is an uh, uh, interesting area where Sunnis and Shi'is, uh, or adherents of pre-Islamic Iran with Muslims, uh, newcomers, uh, or indigenous people uh, clashed. But one must also add that inside this area, there were other, how to say, uh, sub-subalterns. So these local groups had their own problems. So it wasn't hardly, hard, it wasn't a, a unified area. So as we know that uh, the Twelvershi, Ale Bauwand, or the Bauwandi dynasty very much disliked the Nizaris, and they, they developed a very interesting ideology that the Nizaris are newcomers and non-Iranians, uh, while the Bauwandis, of course, we are the true Iranian, Sassanian descendants, and of course, we are good Twelvershis. But in the same time, the Nizaris also developed an idea that we are Iranians, Dalamites, of course, we are Shis, and these Khwarizmians or Seljuks represent something like a, a foreign influence. So it's a very complicated and highly complex issue. No, this time, I would like to focus on a special source called the Divani Koyemiyat, which was discovered only four, uh, six, seven years ago, and it was published only in 2011. As the title of the Divani Koyemiyat suggests, the main aim of this collection of Qasidas is to celebrate and hail the announcement of the Qiyamah by, Nizar, by the Nizar Imam Hassan Allah Zikri as Salam, which took place in 1164. The proclamation of the Qiyamah left a profound impact on the Nizari Ismail thought of the, Alamut period, of the late Alamut period. While the Nizari Ismail Dawa of the time continued to adhere to the foundational principles of classical Shi and Fatimid Ismailism, there emerged an additional set of conceptual formulations to reflect the new intellectual vistas that opened out in the age of the announcement of the Qiyamah. Besides the rules that Taslim of Nasir al-Din Tusi and the half bab Bob Sayyid No, which is wrongly attributed to Hassan al-Sabbah, the Divani Qayyemiyat is one of the most important literary Nizari Ismaili products generated by the heightened expectations following the proclamation of the Qiyama 1164. Being a primary religious doctrinal work, the importance of the Divani Qayyemiyat lies not only in its Nizari Ismaili theological importance, but it can be assessed as an interesting historical source as well. Given that the later Alamut period in Ismaili history is extremely poor in genuine Nizari historical works, chronicles, the political events mentioned in the Divan Koyemiyat is of particular importance. Its text full with references and allusions to various events, political persons for the period between 1164 and, <clears throat> and 1256. 
And since the Divan Koyamiat is the, a newly emerged source, it is no wonder that there has not been a case study relating to its historical importance. The Divan Koyamiat itself has three officially recognized manuscripts, the oldest one dating back to 1404, according to its colophon, so its Timurid period. Manuscripts, the two other manuscripts are from the end of the 17th century. All of these manuscripts were compiled in present-day Iran and until now have been in the possession of Ismaili communities of Iran and India and were recently, recently rediscovered by Jalal Badakhshani. The same scholar prepared these manuscripts for the first modern edition, uh, which was published in 2011 in Iran, along with the cooperation of uh, Shafi, Professor Shafi Katkani. However, Badak uh, uh, however, Badakshani recently uh, <coughs> was informed about the existence of new other manuscripts of the Divani Koimiat, which were discovered in present-day Afghanistan and are said to be possessed by local Ismailis. The entire published collection, uh, uh, relying on the three existing manuscripts, uh, consists, uh, consists of 157 kasidas in classical Persian language. The main author and compiler of the Divani Koyamat was called Hassan Mahmoud Khatib, a well-known Ismaili poet and intellectual of the late Ismaili, late Almut period. According to the Qasida number no. eight, the existing, uh, two, uh, the existing uh, 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 manuscripts or the uh, parts of the uh, uh, Qasidas were put together in 1233, but we, sure, we are sure that there were later editions as late as 1250 uh, when the last of the Qasidas were composed. The main, uh, as, as I told, Hassan Mahmoud Khatib was the main author, but not the exclusive author of the whole text, because there were earlier poems composed by other, perhaps less famous characters of the Nizari uh, period, such as Rais Hassan or Jamal or Amid Ali. The present paper examines the earliest contacts between the Nizari Ismailis and the Mongol Empire from the time of the arrival of the Mongols uh, until uh, the period of Alamut, and uh, the siege of Alamut. Though evidences are rather scarce, however, or main uh, sources relating to this period uh, suggest that the Nizari Ismaili state in northern Iran was a keen follower of dramatic events around his realm and successfully balanced between contending power of his time. This highly diplomatic approach apparently lacked any kind of open hostility towards the Mongols uh, until, the end of, uh, until the death of Jalaluddin Mengborni. As a result, the Nizari Ismaili state successfully continued its expansionist policy, which had started in the decades preceding, preceding the first Mongol conquest of Persia. In the last, um, as far as the beginnings of Mongol-Iranian, uh, uh, Mongol-Nizari relations, we must mention the rule of Jalaluddin Hassan, or Hassan III. Uh, as in, uh, it was the period, in 1219, the Mongols, as we know, attacked uh, Central Asia and Iran. And the first Muslim ruler to send envoys to the Mongol camp was Hassan III, the, uh, the Nizari Imam. According to Juvaini, uh, Jalaluddin Hassan was the first Muslim ruler to try to come to terms with the Mongols after the crossing of the Oxus in August uh, 1219. In a later event, in the spring of 1221, Nizari envoys personally visited the camp of Genghis Khan near Balkh. So that means that even from the earliest period, Nizaris closely follow the Mongol steps. Usually, the Nizaris are depicted as the victims of the Mongols. It, of course, this, uh, this concept was heavily influenced, heavily influenced by the um, siege of Alamut and the, and the total elimination of the Nizari state under Hulegu. However, uh, the data offered by the Divani Koimiat shows a rare insight to even preceding the time found. The first important thing that the name of Hulegu never appears in this text. The, it looks like the author or the authors uh, uh, lived uh, uh, the pre, in, the, in the previous period. That's why Hulegu was never mentioned, and there is no reference to the Mongol siege of Alamut or Gertku or, or, or Lamosar or other areas. Um, as for the Divani Kaimiyat, it contains both historical data relating to the Nizari Mongol contacts, and of course there is a special perception developed by this text about the Mongols and the Mongols' character and their and their role in the Nizari Ismaili eschatology. Let's first let's uh, let's have a look on the historical data. 
Uh, after the first Mongol attacks of uh, Khorasan in northern Iran, when the Mongols attacked Marv, Nishapur, Sarahs, and Ray, Nizaris, according to Nasawi and uh, Rashid al-Din and Ibn al-Athir, Nizaris appeared around the areas of Damgan and Bestam, and they conquered these cities. Uh, because of the ruined Khwarezmian administration, it wasn't an, a difficult issue for them. These events are com totally and clearly confirmed in this text called the Vonekoyemiat. In the Kassida well, number 124, echoes of the Nizari conquest of Damgam, Bestam, and Mehrim can also be found. Uh, <coughs> The poetical text explicitly mentions the penetration of Nizaris to Damgan after the Mongol attack. Furthermore, the Kassida stresses that the Nizaris conquered castles and fortresses of Kasran province and of Iraq, that perhaps Iraqi Ajan. The Khwarizmian governor of Halkhal is also mentioned in this Kassida, uh, who resisted the Nizaris in western Gilan and Azerbaijan. He was eventually murdered by three Fidais, who were particularly praised for the deed. The Divani Kaimiat mentions the conquest of Bestam and Mech Mechrin in another point. Kassida number 73, in, in Kassida number 73, we learn about the Nizari conquest of Bestam and Mechrin. Uh, thus, it looks like that Nizari forces based in Gertkuk uh, all successfully retook some important fortresses. If you, if, we have, if we have a look on the map, we see that uh, uh, especially the Nizaris stationed in, da, in, in the area of uh, Gertzku were active because Bestam, Domgon, Mehrin were in this area. So uh, it looks like they, they quickly exploited uh, the political chaos created by the Mongols and they captured these very rich cities. But uh, the Divan Kaimet in this sense offers cl clear evidence. But besides territorial changes following the first Mongol conquest of Persia, an equally important question is the analysis of the Nizari perceptions about the Mongols preserved in the Divani Kaimiyat. Apparently, one can detect a certain kind of chronolog chronological duality in the early Mongol Nizari context as it was depicted by the Divani Kaimiyat. The Divani Kaimiyat completed uh, sometimes uh, around 1250, and uh, uh, it is very interesting to see that this evolution, how the Mongols are represented in the text. First, in the first period, between the years 1219 and 1231, rolled it to the death until the death of Jalaluddin Mengburni, uh, it, the, 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 the Divani Kaimiyat shows something like a flourishing and very cordial contacts between the Mongols and the Nizaris. As it, was, as it was well known, the Nizaris had been informed quickly about the upcoming Mongol military operation. Uh, the fact that early Nizari Mongol contacts might not be entirely unhappy is somehow reflected in the Divani Kaimiyat. Here we can find some interesting perceptions about the Mongols, uh, as represented by some, some of these bites of the Divani Kaimiyat. Mongols, and especially Genghis Khan, are depicted here as heroes who help the Nizaris at the end of times as it has been prophesized. The grace of the Lord of Faith has come to an end. The promise, of about, the promise about Mustansir and Nizar came to an end. The fitna of the end of times by the divine command came to end through the Tatar army. This army went all over the world and there arrived dust from the earth until the highest heaven. The first Han was Genghis and first he treated us with loving devotion. This is a part of Kassida 49 which clearly depicts the Nizari perceptions about the Mongols. Uh, this divine messianic characters is clearly evident in other Kassidas. Uh, and the first Mongol ruler, that is Genghis Khan, somehow hailed as a divine messenger uh, who was directed against the Turks, that means the Khwarizmians, by the order of the Imam. That is uh, more uh, strikingly demonstrated in different other Kassidas, uh, such as in uh, just a minute. Uh, in another Kassida, where uh, Genghis is uh, clearly depicted as the divine messenger sent by the, Alamut, the Imam of Alamut. Uh, on the other hand, 
there are, uh, in the other historical sources, such as in Ibn al-Athir or Rashid al-Din, there is some hint, there are some references to secret relations between Nizaris and Mongols, and newly discovered, newly man, uh, emerged Chinese sources also briefly uh, hint to uh, the sending of envoys, Nizari envoys to the Mongol court. Uh, by the courtesy of Christopher Atwood, I came to know some passages of the uh, Yuan Shi, which mentions the arrival of Badr al-Din Ahmad, and the, the, the representative of the Mulayid state, to the Mongol court, in 1229. So these uh, conclusions were, I mean, the Divan Kaimiyat's uh, very positive attitude towards the early Mongol uh, con uh, attacks, especially towards Genghis Khan, is confirmed by <coughs> other sources. Rashid Odin also, also mentions that he heard about a Nizari Ismaili Mongol alliance, although he, did, uh, he had some disbelief and, and doubt about it. He, as he men mentioned that, but he heard about, I heard about that the Nizaris made a pact with the Mongols as it was alleged by the heretics. So the certain kind of insurgency can be detected in the words of Rashid Oddin, but these uh, uh, glorifying abiyat of the Divani Koimiyat, where the Mongols, especially Genghis Khan, was hailed as a hero or a messenger, completely confirms our knowledge about the Mongol, cordial Mongol Nizari relations on apparently a political alliance. Why they were allied? The, the, the alliance was against the Khwarizmians, of course. In some, some of these Kasidas of the Divani Koimiyat, there is a reference to the end of the rule of the Turks. That means the Khwarizmians. Although the picture is rather mixed, because uh, in Kasida 57, we hear there is a lament about the loss of Central Asian cities, such as Bukhara, Samarkand, and the cities of Khorasan, which were destroyed by the Mongols. And as it was quoted, the throne was not left to the Sultan of Khwarizm. But in general, they, hail, they, they condemned the rule of the Turks. And in this sense, they click, cleverly followed the policy of the enemy of my enemy, as it was uh, their good old attitude before the, Nizar, before the Mongol period. But uh, as it, it, it looks like that the Divani Kaimiyat uh, served as a pretext for their own, uh, old policy, but uh, uh, with some additional eschatological uh, uh, flavor. On the other hand, um, just a minute. There is a more, however, there is a second period of Mongol Nizari relations in the represented in the Divani Kaimyat. That means that uh, after this very happy and very uh, flourishing contacts uh, of the early Mongol Nizari period. There's a more mixed depiction of the Mongols, depiction of the Mongols, uh, probably following the death of Jalaluddin Mingborni, the last Khwarizmi ruler, who was the common enemy both the, of the Mongols and the Nizaris. Uh, that means that uh, it is uh, there, is, uh, there are Kasidas which are not so friendly towards the Mongols. That means that. Uh, uh, in Kasida 70, uh, 78, we learned that uh, Genghis Khan, who had been merciful towards the Nizaris originally, later diverged from his divine path and wanted to imprison the, imprison the Nizari Imam, who in response sent Fidais to the Mongol camp to murder the Mongol ruler. Another legendary and controversial element belonging to the second sub-period of Mongol-Nizari relations in the Divan Kaimiyat uh, is the story about the Genghis Thani, that means the second Genghis, that means it could have been Ögödei, who sent, who according to Kasida 49 and 133, sent his brother Chagatai or Chaktai in the text to, to destroy the Nizari fortresses. Look at uh, 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 Kasida uh, 133, tell us now the story of the killing of Chagatai. Uh, for the first look, it looks like, that as for the identification of Chagatai, it, is, for the, it looks like that he's the, he's the brother of, uh, of Ögödei, because we know that one of his brothers was called Chagatai. However, uh, there is no other source referring to the death or, or the murder assassination of Chagatai by Nizaris. On the other hand, we are informed that there was a prominent Mongol military leader in Noyon operating in the South Caucasus, who was na whose name was Chagatai Noyon, or Chagatai Korchi, the Chagatai the Quiver be uh, Bearer. 
And it, maybe he's, he is represented in the text. As for Chagatai Korci and his activity, we know much details from Armenian sources and Rashiduddin and Ibn Nasir as well. Uh, Chagatai Korci appeared in 1233 in the, in the Caucasus when he subjugated numerous important Georgio Armenian fortresses such as Lore, Tbilisi, Dumanis, and Shamshuldis. Kyriakos Ganzaketsi, a contemporary Armenian historian, has a very detailed report about the sophisticated methods used by the Mongols led by Chagatai Korci. Chagatai Korci Noyon was active in Armenia, and according to Kyriakos Ganzaketsi, uh, uh, he was killed somewhere after 1240 AD. Uh, uh, from other sources, we know that uh, some other Armenian sources suggest that Chagatai Korchi was still alive in 1249. When several Georgian Armenian princes revolted against the Mongols due to the taxes lev levied by Chagatai Korchi, it is noteworthy that this riot was suppressed by the uh, by Baiju and not by Chagatai Korchi. That means that he could have been perished about uh, 1249, 1250. That means this uh, this means that he could have been killed by the Nizaris in 1249-50 if we identify this second this Chagatai with not the son of Genghis, but this Chagatai Korchi. Because uh, we know at that time that the Nizaris had problems with the Mongols. So after the death of Jalaluddin, the Mongols quickly uh, started focusing on the Nizaris mile issue, and they hired Armenians against them. We know that King Hatum of Cilicia was almost killed by Nizaris. So it looks like that an Armenian-Mongol uh, alliance uh, was set up in the Southern Caucasus to counter the Nizaris. In, in this context, the assassination of a prominent Mongol leader is more than possible in, in my eyes. That means that, uh, uh, and it looks like that Chagatai Korchi was a single, uh, most prom single prominent Mongol victim of the Nizari assassinations between, uh, uh, before 1256. Uh, this Kassid of 133 is a very picturesque <coughs> story about the death of Chagatai Korchi. A day Chagatai boasted himself, in the world I will conquer thousand well fortified fortresses by attack. I do not fear the wound by a sword, and I do not show a piece of dignity to the mujahids of the world. Husamuddin Hassan bin Ali Jawan Mardi, who became the sign of generosity in the world and in the faith, he stood up in the desire of defending his opinion, embracing perfect decision, right goal, and firm view. Four other Amirs agreed with him as well and made their way to the table from the throne. The killing and the turmoil became so much that at the field as if a cloud would have made there a blossoming meadow from ruby. So it is a bit uh, a Baroque language uh, from the Kasida, but clearly depicts the end of this Mongol leader. Uh, uh, there, uh, uh, it is also important to stress that uh, the death of Chagatai Korchi completely overrides the datation uh, of the Divani Kaimet. According to Badakhshani, the last Qasidas were composed or completed in 1243, when we have the last data about the life of Hassan Mahmud Khatib. However, if we uh, give credibility to the fact that Chagatai Korchi was killed 1250, that means that the, there were even later Qasidas, or what does it mean? Does it mean that uh, Hassan Mahmud Khatib penned or, or, or other poets? We don't know it exactly. But it certainly lends a very dramatic uh, 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 character to the text, which was looks like, which looks like uh, to be finalized only five, six years before uh, the siege of Alamut. And the direct consequences of the murder assassination of Chagatai Korchi can be felt in other sources. It is also known that the successor of Chagatai Korchi in the South Caucasus, Caucasus who was Baiju, uh, uh, complained to Mönke about the Nizaris as early as 1251, so that only one year after the possible killing of Chagatai Korchi. This letter of complaint addressed to Mönke is perhaps connected with the murder of Chagatai. 
Uh, as of course, we have other d d information about the deterioration of Mongol Nizari context, such as the uh, harsh language used by Guyuk at his enthronement in 1246 against the Nizaris. We know about a Nizari, or allegedly Nizari, envoy sent to the English court 1238. It is also worth to mention that 1238, the Nizari uh, revived the Bavandit kingdom in Mazenderan. The same Bavandit kingdom, which had been destroyed by the Nizari, in 1210 was revived because of the, after a, 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 a dynastic marriage between a Nizari princess and the Bavandit prince. That also uh, looks like that the Nizari started preparations for defending their core areas against the Mongols in my eyes. Um, Finally, to conclude some notes about the imp ideological importance of this cordial or uh, I mean this, this uh, more mixed Mongol concept. Uh, uh, of the divine coimet. That means that the Nizaris were not always the subalterns of the Mongols, not always the persecution, persecuted or not misunderstood community. Even they were highly pragmatic towards the Mongols when, when, they were, when, it, when it served their interests. They completely allied with the Mongols. The other main important, uh, my, uh, main, main conclusion is that it helps to explain the attitude of some leading Nizari uh, intellectual uh, in this period, especially that of Nasiruddin Tusi, who was always portrayed as a chameleon, who started as a, uh, a Nizari, then he became a partisan of the Mongols and became a Twervershi. But based on the Nizar, uh, Divani Kaimat, it looks like that there existed a very strong pro-Mongol lobby and that during the time of Alauddin Muhammad or Muhammad III, the penultimate ruler of Alamut. And, and it looks like that uh, one of the representatives of this pro-Mongol group could have been Nasruddin Tusi. Both Nasruddin Tusi and Hassan Mahmud Kateb uh, were contemporaries. Both of them spent years together in Kuhestan. Then both of them moved to Alamut. And I think it very much the fact that the pro-Mongol attitude existed in uh, Alamut to a certain period helps explain the quick how to say, flex, the flexibility of Nasir ad din Tusi after 1256. And of course, uh, uh, it, 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 it must be worked out. So it's, it's, it's my idea that it helps to explain. On the other hand, there's a more and very interesting evidence for the pro-Mongol attitude of the Alamutian, Alamutian Nizaris. Uh, uh, t uh, because when the Mongols 1220 uh, or 1219 attacked Kuhistan or southern Khorasan, uh, the Muhtasham of the Nizari Muhtasham of Kuhistan, that means southern Khorasan, hosted many Khwarizmi refugees, and it totally it, it totally uh, caused an anger in in Alamut and. Uh, uh, Alauddin Muhammad demanded the removal of the Nizari governor of Kuhistan because he was quite unhappy that the, Mongo that the Nizaris hosting, were, were hosting the enemies of the Mongols because the Mongols were the new friends of the Nizaris. So it is, it is mentioned by Juzjani. So it's a very interesting story, which also underpins my theory about the Mongol Nizari contacts. So in some, I think that the, the question of subalternity in the case of the late Nizari period uh, relating to the Mongols is much more complex and uh, is, uh, is showing both signs of conflict and cooperation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nicholas, very much. Questions from the floor? Thank you for the paper, very interesting. And the, do you think that the Nisaris got trapped in the same uh, strategy made by the Mongols of making think anybody that is behind or behind their immediate enemies to think they were going to be their allies? And then by the time they arrived there, they become enemies as well, as far as you don't recognize the Mongols as superior rulers. I mean, this, is hap this happened to everybody that puts in their way. The first, the Khurasam Shahs were not disturbed by the Mongols and they saw it like there is this uh, Genghis Khan saying that he was the ruler of the East and the Khurasan Shah was the ruler of the West until things go bad and then they go against it. So the, the Nisaris didn't fall into this idea of they're going to be allies until it was their turn. That's my point. And so it does explain in a way the change of attitude that you are, you are putting here. At the beginning they thought, oh, we have an ally here against the Khurasmian. 
and they eventually turn around and they are against us as well. What yeah. do you see? In my, in my analysis of the, the whole draft I prepared, I'm preparing for the Institute of Islam Studies, I try to follow the, the new attitudes from the beginning, right. from the time of Hassan and Sabah until the end of uh, under the rule of uh, Rokhon de Hosha. I always felt that they were much highly pragmatical in their relations. I think mean, from uh, other sources we know that uh, there were Nizari mercenaries in the Sajuk army. Uh, there were Nizaris, uh, even there were pro-Nizari groups in, in the Khwarizmian court, in the court of Sanjar. So if you read the Makamate Jendefil, which is a very anti-Nizari source, actually. It's a Sunni uh, text, but it full, it's, it's full with references. So the Nizaris were very highly pragmatic. And unlike other Caspian kingdoms, they were successful to find always somebody in the backyard of their enemies to neutralize their policy. But in the case of, in case of Mongols, I think they, they miscalculated the, uh, the, the level of threat. And after the elimination of Jalaluddin Mingburni, of course, it wasn't their merit, but after the dissolution of the Khwarizmians, they hardly, uh, they, I think they believed that they can find a new counterbalance against the Mongols. However, the Mongol Empire wasn't disrupted after the death of Genghis or Ugudei. And instead, oh, they started to revive the local principalities, especially the Bavan, they, they sent messengers to the Crusaders of Europe, but it, it was no avail. And that was the reason why, why they collapsed. But until the uh, elimination of the threat of the Khwarizmians, they quickly and well played against the Khwarizmians. When the uh, Jalaluddin once repro uh, uh, reproached the, the Nizaris for their contacts held with the Mongols, because he sent uh, uh, Nasawi, the very important author and uh, special secretary of uh, Jalaluddin, to the uh, Alamut and asked them, why do you maintain con are you maintaining contacts with the Mongols? And the, the diplomatic answer was, oh, they are, these are our neighbors. It's, uh, it's, it's our duty to have, uh, maintain contacts with them. Uh, well, th thank you very much. It sounds like a, a very exciting new find. Um, now, um, just to, to, to put my own mind at rest, I'm going to argue tomorrow that religious minorities, but the Nizaris were not a religious minority in their territories probably, that they do not comment on, uh, on, on, on the history they are living through, actually. Um, they don't write about it, I and mean, this, this is different. So I would like to know two things. What were these Qasidas for? I mean, are, are they sort of court, they're, they're part of court patronage? Well, uh, the Qasida, the title is Divan Ekoimiyat. It is a collection of Qasidas celebrating the, the Qiyam, the great resurrection. Yes. It's uh, something like a millenarian uh, e e e explanation or of, a, of a, uh, which means that it, it is the, the end of times is coming and we have uh, the, the Quran is abrogated, the Sharia is abrogated. Of course, it's a difficult and different, a very and complex and thing. Any, is that their real yes, thing the main aim of this Qasida is to celebrate the Qiyamah and, and celebrate the Imams after the Qiyamah. That means Hassan al Zikri as Salam, Nuruddin Muhammad, uh, uh, and other rulers. But it also, but they, the, the Qasidas, uh, as we saw, contain historical events uh, incorporated in this messianistic uh, character. So it's a mixture of messianistic characters and, 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 and real events. Somehow, not all of the events are clear for me. So when there is a Qasida, Qasida number 50 speaks about a, a war against the Malek Gilan, the ruler of Gilan. Who was the ruler of Gilan? He doesn't specify that he's a Bavandid ruler, a Baduspanid, or a Zaydite prince of Dailam. And there are names which we can't decipher. So I found a name which is uh, completely unknown other sources. So this is the reason that is, uh, there, is a no his, there is no history, proper Nizarism historiography. Of course, we have the Sargosh Sayed now. We have the fragments of the Ketabe Bozorg Omid. Uh, but up, uh, there are no administrative records, only a a few coins we have, but there is no historiography, unfortunately. But these texts can be used something like a, 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 a very inter important source for the later Nizari decades. Apart and and, and, and could you reflect on the question why the Iranian and especially the Indian communities would have copied and recopied this particular well, collection of texts? Because, the, uh, because of the importance of the Qiyama. It is one of okay. the, uh, okay. the most uh, sacred uh, event in the eyes of the contemporary Nizaris. 
So the Kiyama declaration of Kiyama is still <coughs> is, is a subject of uh, uh, religious debates and, uh, and disp disputes among Nizaris, and they is still celebrated. And Hassan II was the first first Imam who, who of course, he originally called himself the Hujja, that means the representative of the Imam, and he officially declared that he's a descendant of Nizar. Of physically, he was showed appearance to Muhammad ibn Buzur Gomid, but spiritually, he was the Nizari. Uh, uh, he, has, he has a Nizari ancestry. That means, the, uh, and that for this reason, it is a very sacred. Uh, it, this even has a very sacred memory for the contemporary Nizaris, those living in Iran, in Badakhshan, in Afghanistan, in Tajikistan, as well as all over the world. Okay, thanks very much. Okay. I came across uh, a coin, a Nizari coin, uh, which celebrated the Kiyama, and it was a gold, it was a dinar, and it, as far as I remember, it was right at the end of the 12th century, late 1190s. How does that relate to the material that you're talking about now? Well, uh, if it's dated to the end of the 12th century, it's completely fits to the uh, uh, the celebration of the Kiyama because the we don't know, as I told you, that we don't know exactly when the, and how the Divanic climate was composed. It, I think it, it took time, so it, when it, was a, it was a collection of Kassidas. There right are at different times. Yes, uh, of course, there is another historical Kassidas which, which speaks about the assassination of, uh, of an Ildigwizid ruler, Kizil Arslan, who was killed in uh, 1180. 86 or 89, so it, it is a very early material. Uh, but on the other hand, we have the very later Kassidas. If the, co your co the coin you, you mentioned is dated to the end of the 12th century, it is completely contemporary of the earliest Kassidas of the Divani Koyamat, following the uh, proclamation of 1164. All right. And, and there is a oh, question there. Yeah, Carol. Yeah, sorry. Does the D1 actually give any details of what actually happened at the Qiyama? I see. Uh, so the, you mean the description of the festival? Yes, or um, the, him coming down from the mountain and all that stuff. No. no. As far as I know, well, in every, each of the Qasidas focuses on the Qiyama and this message, but there is no historical description found in the D1 yet. We know that Rashid Oddin and the half Kalam Epir uh, and some Arab sources, or Bano Kati has a description, but as far as the Divani Koimiat, uh, I don't remember any, any story, any, any episode about the historicity of the Kiyama. But there's, there's I made some there. researches on it. Yes, and, and festivities which followed that event, and, and how, I mean, because um, the Sharia was now abrogated in what way that changed the society of the Nizaris? That's all very blurred in my mind. I don't. Is there anything there? In well, the of course. Well, the, the the declaration of the Kiyama was at the end of the Dora Satra. Yes. So it was a complete, uh, how to say, a, a new period, and it quant it strictly follows the this. Uh, uh, ideas of the seven word periods of the Nizaris. So we, they believed that there were seven periods and every period had an imam and a natik, and every natik is the imam of the, uh, uh, the next period. And uh, there are references to this, and there are many references to the Quran, so there are messianistic quotations from other uh, Ismaili texts and from the Holy Quran itself. Actually, as for the Qiyama, I made some quite uh, uh, and how to say, uh, un, unprecedented, uh, un, how to say, non, not, not, well, un, not, well, I made some researches and I, I s feel that there are strong historical reasons to believe that there was a split in the Nizari community at about, at about 1164, because uh, we know that Hassan II, the, who declared the Qiyama, was quickly killed after this event, and we know that the killer was, was his own brother-in-law, who propagated the Buid legitimacy. So I feel something like a, a localist or, 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 or a... Um, Mm, uh, a nativist attitude clashing with an internationalist attitude. But it's, a two, uh, it's, it's not the subject of the present, it's beyond the scope of the present lecture. No, but, but it's fascinating, thank you. <laughs> no, well, sorry for the long, long answer. No, not at all. Any other
Nicholas, thank you very much. <clears throat>